Okay, we're recording. All right, so hello, it's me, Ed Gallo for uh, FightSite.com. This is the, the Wrestling for MMA podcast, episode two. Episode one was just like the pilot where I ranted on my own about like what the concept is and talked about some of my own work a little bit and things of that nature. Uh, but yeah, I didn't mention it. Oh, I mentioned it on my original recording and then my original recording didn't work that well so then i redid it but originally i said that you know i want to have guests on uh you know wrestlers coaches fighters writers analysts fans whoever um who have some sort of insights to share uh which is a lot of people because it's a pretty broad subject so i definitely planned on having guests the whole time and uh yeah just you know i thought of zach pretty quickly uh just because i'm trying to think of who i know that like coaches wrestling and Specifically, I think I wanted somebody who has coached at a youth level, uh, just because, not to talk down to MMA fighters, but I think coaching at a youth level and teaching MMA fighters how to wrestle is actually, there should be a lot of parallels, but we'll see. But yeah, uh, yeah this, is, this is my first guest, my second podcast. Uh, yeah, this is Zach, and uh, I'll just let you introduce yourself, and afterwards, I'd like you to talk about... Uh, you know, how you got involved in wrestling, just give us the whole rundown on your whole story, you know, let the people know who you are and what you what you bring to the table. All right, so uh, my name is Zach Goldrosen. I'm from Marlboro, New Jersey, and I, the way I got started in wrestling, um, I'm, my dad was a coach. Uh, he coached high school and middle school up in North Jersey, he coached youth wrestling here in Central Jersey for a little while. And um, when I was around pre-K, kindergarten, my dad used to bring me to his practices over at the Matawan Rec. And so I was one of those, like, um, I was one of those coaches' sons, like a little kid that that would kind of just screw around with the, with the wrestlers in between stuff. And then once I got old enough to start wrestling in the Marlboro Rec, the interesting is my dad didn't actually go ahead and sign me up. He asked me if I wanted to wrestle. Oh, nice. And I said, I actually told him no. <laughs> Here, Zach, you want to wrestle? No, dad. I want to play basketball. Zach, you want to wrestle this year? No, dad. I want to keep sucking at basketball. And then, actually, my younger brother got into it before I did. And then finally in fifth grade, I said, you know what? Gonna give it a try. And I wasn't any better at wrestling for a couple years. And then the summer after sixth grade uh, was um, when it was right around when Mike Mallett moved uh, Rhino Wrestling Club over to uh, Wall, New Jersey. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of Mike Mallett, he's a big figurehead with uh, Flow Wrestling now, particularly with looking at technique. And before that, he was running Rhino Wrestling Club, which is the club that I wrestled at growing up. Um, the wall is pretty close, is sort of close to Marlboro. And just like with starting wrestling, my dad didn't go and sign me up for the club. He said, hey, Zach, do you want to do this? Which I, I think was a big difference. And I said, sure. And... And so I was going to Rhino every summer, around four or five nights a week. Then going all through middle school and high school. And, um, and as I learned more about the sport and learning how to love wrestling, because I think most people, it does take a little bit of time to learn how to like the sport. Um, then in high school, I was uh, I wrestled in the the Shore Conference, which some wrestling people may have heard of. It's a pretty strong area for wrestling in New Jersey. It was a two time region qualifier, and then I after high school I went to go wrestle at the College of New Jersey, which most people know as TCNJ. Some older people would know, might know it as Trenton State. Um, TCNJ is generally historically one of the more highly regarded division three wrestling programs. And I was basically just a room guy over there. And then, yeah, I was a room guy for two years. And then 
early my junior year, uh, the coaching staff uh, cut me from the program. Um, one second, I got to plug my phone in. Got <laughs> that. Good. Um, so I was cut from the program at TCNJ, and because this was ju my junior year, I just thought, all right, whatever, two more years of college, and then I'm going to grow up, get a real job, what have you. But it just felt like something was missing, uh, particularly around 3.30, 3.15, 3 3.30, which was when practice was. It just, just felt wrong having nowhere to go at that time. And uh, I had thought about transferring to Muhlenberg because that was actually my second choice coming out of high school. But I... I didn't know how to bring that up to my parents. Then again, it was actually my dad who texted me, do you want to look into transferring to Muhlenberg? I had never mentioned anything about this to him. I was like, oh yeah. I... So I emailed uh, the head coach over there. His name is Sean Lally. He wrestled for Pitt. Oh, gotcha. And then he... I went through the transfer process, got to Muhlenberg, January of my junior year, I won two matches that year. One was a forfeit. One was over an opponent from Yeshiva. Nice. Or to Shlomo. But, um, Word up. And then put in one last good summer at Rhino, maybe one last push. And then my senior year, I finished fourth in the Centennial Conference at 197. Um, and then, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, it's your senior year, you know, just go from there. <laughs> year, um, I had lost a few credits uh, due to the transfer, so I still had another year of school. Oh, nice. And, I was and we were all hoping that maybe I'd be able to find one more year of eligibility because I barely competed when I was at TCNJ. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, like, um, Coach Lally was looking into that. I uh, was working with the athletic department on that. And then one day in September, I ran into the assistant AD while I was in the weight room. She called me over. She said, oh, Zach, I've actually been meaning to talk to you. And it turned out that I had no more eligibility. So... That was the end of that. Jeez. And then I, I asked, like, hey, could I still come in the room a few days a week and help out? Mm -hmm. And they all said, yeah, we've had student assistant coaches before. And what was originally supposed to be just a couple days a week ended up being I was in there every day from the beginning of practice through the end, traveling with the team everywhere. I was... I ended up doing pretty much everything that a part-time assi uh, assistant coach would be expected to do at the D3 level. And that was where I, that was where I decided that I wanted to be a wrestling coach. And that was what I wanted to do with myself. Then that season, uh, that season ended. And then in 2017, I went out to the Maccabee games trials, which for those of you who don't know it, the Maccabee Games are essentially the Jewish Olympics. So I went out to, uh, to the Maccabee Team USA trials, finished fourth in that. So I did not get to go to uh, I did not get to wrestle in the games, but 2021 games are coming up next year, assuming All right. assuming nothing gets complicated. Mm -hmm. So I'm training for that right now and um my first coaching job out of college was at was over in New Brunswick, New Jersey, which is where Rutgers is. Mm -hmm. um, the head coach at the time was a guy named Jason McLean, who was actually Muhlenberg Wrestling's first All-American, which was how we got in contact. And then when Coach Lally uh, stepped down at Muhlenberg, McLean took over at Muhlenberg, and so there was a little bit of a shakeup at New Brunswick, and they moved me to the middle school. 
Uh, I was the head coach at New Brunswick Middle School for a year. Oh, nice. And then the following spring, um, the head coach at Marlboro, who this wasn't the coach that I wrestled for, um, but it was a guy I'd known for a long time. His name is Charlie Frankel. He was a D3 All-American for DelVal. He was a, actually a two-time state placer for Marlboro. So I've, I've known him from the time I started wrestling. And he reached out. He said, hey, Zach, we're looking for someone to work with our big guys. So he laid it out for me. Um, and we originally agreed on uh, two days a week, no competitions, just come in, roll with the big guys a couple days a week. And just like at Muhlenberg, that turned into I'm in the room every day. I'm at every practice, every match. Because, I mean, that's what we do as coaches. Not about us. It's, it's about our guys and girls. Mm -hmm. And I recently just finished up my second season at Marlboro. I expect to be back next year for a third. I hope so. <laughs> awesome. I have, I have a few notes that just ran through my mind as you were talking. Uh, I mean, first of all, I haven't mentioned it yet. Zach and I are both Jewish. There's like a weird amount of uh, Jewish people in wrestling, which is interesting because they're usually not associated with combat sports. Uh, ben Cohn, who writes for the Fight Site, is my friend an article about why don't we see uh, orthodox jews in combat sports anymore and he kind of yeah that was nice he kind of outlined the history there um i mean like boxing and, and wrestling used to be like really, really big with uh like the jewish immigrant population 100 years ago uh and boxing's fallen off but i don't know wrestling seems like uh the tradition didn't die as much just because it's not as hazardous to your health inherently on its face so uh i guess jewish parents <laughs> aren't as paranoid about that one uh yeah i'm wearing my wearing my israel wrestling shirt uh i think this is from usa wrestling i'm not sure yeah so that first of all just wanted to put that out there uh and uh second for those like who don't have the context uh you said two-time regional qualifier for for new jersey is that right zach you still there your picture is frozen on my end so I'm just going to keep talking, and then hopefully you'll come back eventually. Uh, but, but yeah, two-time regional qualifier, I believe, is what you said. Um, and if it's like other states where it goes regionals and then states, that's actually a pretty huge accomplishment in New Jersey. It's a one-class system. Uh, so I mean, like Pennsylvania, for example, is two classes. California is one class, stuff like that. And New Jersey is in this area where the talent is really you know, deep. It's a very competitive place with one class. There's only one state tournament, so everyone in the state's competing at the same tournament, uh, which is not typical in other states. So making it to regionals is like making it to states or placing at states in other less competitive states. Are you here for all that? Did you hear that? I, I heard of that. All right. But well, you're back now. I got you. Yeah. Okay. That was weird. Uh, but yeah, I was just giving context for your, your high school credentials. I think they're actually pretty impressive with context. Uh, but yeah, and then uh, Mike Malinconico, I actually wanted to get your thoughts more on this as a coach. So when I when I watch his videos and I look at his breakdowns, he seems pretty pretty focused on mechanics, right? He likes to break down the mechanics of techniques and how they work and get good at executing them. He he performs things. He's pretty, you know what I mean. He he has nice clean techniques on on his stuff. Um, as a coach, was he more focused on getting you good at doing things? Uh, or did he have like a greater scheme in mind of getting you like how to wrestle in a system or get you like a game as a wrestler? Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not as, not as mobile or mobile athletic as some of the guys who, who wrestle the way that they break down. That's actually sort of a lot of the way the lines that he wrestled himself, mm -hmm. where I was sort of like a poor man's Brent Metcalf. <laughs> Uh, I was just, I would just wrestle hard, wrestle physically, and keep that pace up. Mm -hmm. And so he actually sort of blended that with his, um, with his own sort of more finesse based wrestling. And so it, so um, I'm trying to find the words. I guess he. He found a way to make the way that he wrestles fit 
the broader context of the way that I wrestle instead of mm. trying to make me just wrestle like he did. Gotcha. So he just took, he was taking guys, looking at how they wrestled already and just trying to make improvements and trying to refine it. Um, yeah, a lot of little things. Um, probably the two biggest things technically that I got out of him were the importance of hand fighting and, and just the ability to scramble. Mm-hmm. Which are two huge components of <laughs> of wrestling, so that's pretty important. That's good. Yeah, I mean, I always wondered what he'd be like as a coach, because I know he had that long history with Rhino, and uh, a lot of good guys have come out of there, so I know he's definitely a good coach, but I just wondered what it would be like based on like how he does his breakdowns and stuff. That's cool. Yeah, that was kind of some of the stuff I was thinking about. Uh, also, my sister went to Muhlenberg, so just... Oh. Thought I'd mention that as well. Uh, right. She gra- graduated in twenty. Let's see, three years before I did, twenty thirteen, twenty fourteen, something like that. Uh, but yeah. Okay, then I just missed her. Gotcha. Had I got Muhlenberg straight out of high school, then we would have been on campus at the same time for a couple. Gotcha. Years. She's you probably wouldn't have run in the same thir- circle. She was a you know, theater theater yeah. major. Muhlenberg's big for theater kids. Yeah. Yeah, that was the plan for her. But anyway, so uh, I hope you enjoyed getting your, your story out there because that's definitely an important piece to all of this. And plus, you know, you're just you're, you're a guy. You're, you're a personality on, on the Twitters. And uh, I don't know. I want people to get a, a greater appreciation of who you are and you can put this out there and be like, this is me. Uh, but anyway, I have one very specific topic in mind uh, when I asked you to come on. And this is how it all ties into wrestling for MMA. So... When I think about how MMA fighters become wrestlers and how wrestlers become MMA fighters, uh, they're, they're seem like two very different, you know, tasks. <laughs> I mean, for the wrestlers becoming MMA fighters, that's kind of what the focus of my stuff is about. Is like these guys who already know how to wrestle, they already have their game. How do they incorporate that best in MMA? That's kind of what I like to talk about because I'm like I'm not like a Mike Now guy. I don't super get all the technical intricacies of every single move. Uh, and I don't know every single move. And <laughs> like, that's just not my strong suit. I think big picture is, is a little better for me. Uh, the way things work together, uh, like meta stuff like that. It, it's easier for me to understand. Plus I don't have a lot of hands-on wrestling experience myself beyond like my year on a team. And then just how, what I've gotten through MMA over the years. Like I, I'm just, I'm definitely lacking in that department. Uh, so on the other hand, it's and I, to be to be totally truthful, when I wrestled, I feel like I didn't get taught how to wrestle. I feel like I didn't know how. I'm like that's probably kind of how it is for most people when they first start. But I first started in high school, which is a lot different. Uh, and like, the team was good enough to the point where there were two or three guys with real chances of like making an impact in Pennsylvania too. So Pennsylvania, big states, AAA states. So it's like we had one guy who was ended up winning the state title that year, his brother who qualified, and uh, another guy who had the potential to to make that kind of impact. And maybe rightfully so, the coaches focused on those guys. So basically, the the assistant coaches were kind of just supervising practice and just making sure everything went off all right while the the focus went on the other guys. But I feel like I did not understand how any of it worked. Like I was like doing the drills, I was like doing the practices, I was in great shape. Because I did all the workouts, but like I did not get how to wrestle. Um, so I'm wondering, what would it have been like if, from from the ground up, day one, as a as a younger kid, or just in a situation where I'm specifically being started from the ground up like that? What are the steps people take? How do you get taught? Because like I have that huge disconnect with people like you who've been like around wrestling since they're little kids. Uh, it's totally different. Um, so yeah, I guess my question for you would be. If you took an adult, let's say, an adult who, let's say, regardless of whether or not they want to be an MMA fighter or not, an adult who wanted to learn how to wrestle, and they said, Zach, over the course of, let's call it two years, teach me how to wrestle, what kind of process would you envision? What things would you start first? What would you try to really hammer home for them? Like, what, how would you lay that out? And then if you would also like to say what you actually do with you know, your middle school wrestlers, for example what the differences might be, what the similarities might be. Um, 
I think, I think the, the general, general blueprint, blueprint is, uh, is uh, the same for kids versus adults. Or, but the big change I would make would be with the kids, it would be more like games and fun based to keep them engaged. Mm-hmm. Or like, obviously, yes, I'd want an adult to enjoy, to enjoy wrestling too, but a little easier to keep an adult's attention as opposed to, right. say, a six-year-olds or even a 12-year-olds. Gotcha. So, um, I guess I would start with um, what USA Wrestling calls the seven basic skills. That's uh, For those of you who don't know, that's stance, motion, level change, penetration, lifting, back step, and back arch. So I would work my way through all those because once you've got those skills down and some basic tumbling like forward rolls, backward rolls, uh, cartwheels, etc. Then you you you're able to move in a way that you would have to move in a wrestling match, mm-hmm. and you also have the foundation to learn things like. Um, actually, last summer I was the wrestling specialist at a summer camp called Pine Grove Day Camp in Wall, New Jersey, and mm-hmm. probably ninety. 8% of the kids that I had on a given day weren't actual wrestlers. And I had limited time with each kid. It wasn't a wrestling camp. It was just a camp that happened to have wrestling. So I would have them for about a half hour, 40 minutes, and then they would go off to their next activity. Right. So I would introduce one skill at a time once they... Once I had stance down pat, I would move to motion, then penetration, and each step of the way, I'm not just showing it. I'm also explaining to them why we need that skill. Like, like motion, that's a pretty simple one. I mean, in any sport that I can think of, you're, you have to move your feet in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I'll actually call up a volunteer and and so they can see the difference between say a shot where I'm penetrating versus a shot where I'm not penetrating and they see you're not penetrating your opponent's just too far away uh you know stuff stuff like that um sorry I lost my train of thought okay but yeah I think you it seems like you're moving through the seven basic skills and like yeah. explaining them as you go yeah, and actually, what was nice about the camp was it wasn't like I had to get them ready to wrestle a match. So I right. was able to, I was able to sit and make sure that they had each skill down before I, I went to the next. And ideally, I'm not even teaching any actual moves until they have all seven skills. Mm-hmm. Really? Are you seeing the same kids over and over again in this scenario? Like you're getting a half hour at a time, but you're getting them repeatedly. Um, yeah, the way it worked at that camp was I would have, I would see each group once a week. And then for one activity session, it was called club where the kids got to pick what they did for that session. And Mm -hmm. I would have the same group for the whole week. Gotcha. So you have time to, to get these basics down before you move on into their stuff. Yeah. And especially with club, you get a lot of kids who pick the same thing week in and week out so mm-hmm. club was probably my favorite to work with because one they were the kids who wanted to be there right two i was able to spend a lot more time with them so some of the kids actually ended up getting pretty decent mm-hmm. i've noticed that i i was in a similar situation where i worked at a summer camp for a couple summers and i was like the martial arts specialist which is always karate every time it's karate yeah we, um, we had karate too. <laughs> yeah but i uh i was like eh, screw it so I, I played around with a bunch of different things because, I mean, like, I had a lot at my disposal. Uh, but, it, like, it, it was different where uh, it was pretty much always choice. And I never really got a, consi- a consistent group because it was always, like, okay, this age group for this gender has choice this period. And, like, you're just not getting them on a repeat enough basis uh, to, to actually work something long term. I had, like, one group of girls that, that came a decent amount of time, and I, we were, I really focused boxing for them because I think boxing is faster uh, to, to teach. 
like the very very basics uh like here are the punches <laughs> uh stuff like that like getting a stance here are your punches wrestling like and plus with these kids like to get it structured in a way where they're going to be able to wrestle it's just so hard but yeah basically i was just seeing within my time frame i think i had 45 minutes just trying to see if i could get them to be in stances and shoot double legs and that was it <laughs> like that that took 45 minutes uh, just because with the age the age groups and the size of the groups that were coming in just the way it was structured and plus we we're like warming up and doing like you know relay races and stuff like that and that takes time uh yeah i never even thought about like trying to actually teach them how to wrestle i was just like let's just get them a move or two so they can get interested and maybe someone will come back and i'll, I'll work on it from there um but yeah it, like a couple of kids like they picked up on it really fast i'm like you are better at this than i am already it's so weird. But yeah, I guess it's for adults. It's so different. Um, I have a, I have a friend named Alan who is an amateur MMA fighter right now that I went to pit with, and he hadn't wrestled a day in his life. I don't think he knew anything about it coming into college. So he's you know eighteen, nineteen, and he you know wants to be an MMA fighter. He has one now, uh, but this was way before. And uh, I think he just started like grabbing any wrestler he could find because we had an MMA club, so there were like former wrestlers there grab him whatever wrestler he could find and just like hey wrestle me and it's like making these kids try to take him down over and over and over again and it, eventually as he got better he got access to better people and he started working out with the club wrestlers at pit and then i shouldn't say this he he did make some relationships and start working out with the d1 guys and he's he's like an, a ridiculous wrestler right now so in like four or five years he became well, well-rounded, like overall, actually very good wrestler, plus athletic freak right off the bat. So that, that really worked out for him. But yeah, he, he just, I don't know what he did. I don't think they taught him wrestling. I think he just had this knack for like getting what he had to do and like how to avoid it. Definitely there were certain things that they, they taught him to do, like cross-facing and hand positioning and everything like that and hand fighting and all that. Um, but yeah, he... He'll like show up to a gym and they'll be like, "Oh, where'd you wrestle in college?" Because <laughs> of the, the level he's at right now. So sometimes you get those people. Um, yeah. So let's let's have a scenario. So just to recap scenario where adult who's never done it before comes into you. You have whatever amount of time you have. So you're doing seven basic skills first. Also, it's funny that back arch is one of the seven basic skills because uh, like I can't do it. <laughs> it's like very. I feel like very few. Uh, people that learn wrestling outside of being wrestlers can actually do that. And it's funny that it's actually one of the basics considered because everyone th sees that as like a fancy high amplitude thing where it's actually just one of the essential motions of the sport. Right. Yeah. That, yeah, that, 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 that's, that's, that's just one. That's just one. It's probably the funniest one to watch. Oh yeah. But yeah. So yeah, you got your beginner and you get them to seven basic, they, they can move, they can move in a wrestling kind of way. First of all, just right off the bat with that, you've encountered people who are training for MMA or are MMA fighters and you, you've seen them in action. Do they, do they pass this, this mark for you? Do they look like they've learned the basic like emotions of wrestling? Do you think that do they look like they know how to wrestle? Um, yeah. Even the guys that I wouldn't quite say are good at wrestling. They, they at least have that, that physical literacy. Mm-hmm. And do you think that's from coming from other other combat sports or coming from other sports? Um, well, I'm trying to think. One of them I know wrestled in high school. He actually wrestled for my high school. Uh, mm -hmm. His name is Anthony Ficini. Actually, Rory Singer wrestled for my high school, too. Uh, he was a, um, the ultimate fighter, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah he, gotcha. he, he was there way before me, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's but, another um, guy. Um, one guy, um, named Chris Wing, who fought in Bellator, he, I think, grew up, um, involved in karate, so mm. even though he didn't really grow up wrestling, aside from one year in high school, he, he still knew how to move, he, he moved pretty well, and he actually ended up becoming, I'd say, a competent wrestler. Um, yeah, it seems like there were a lot of guys who if they wrestled at all in high school, it wasn't at any serious level, but they had played various sports, um, including some combat sports. So they kind of had that idea of how to move. Gotcha. 
So that ends up being more important almost than having the know-how of the sport coming in. So let's say someone studied wrestling for, let's say, a few years before they came to you, but they never did an athletic activity in their life and they don't know how to move their body, but they get wrestling. Which would you say would be easier for you to work with? Someone who's very athletic but knows nothing about the sport or somebody who the opposite? Which would you prefer to work with? Um, the easiest ones to work with are definitely the the people who move well but, but mm-hmm. don't know wrestling. Actually, gotcha. one of the kids I had at New Brunswick Middle School, um, he was a big kid. He was my 185 pounder. And he actually, he never wrestled before. He, I think, grew up boxing and playing soccer. Played a little football, too. And I, his, um, he went to a different school in the district and we get bussed over for practice every day. And so we, he was actually at the school while the, he was actually already there and ready to go while the other kids were just getting out of class. So I would mop the mat uh, and whatnot. And we, while the other kids were getting ready, I would just grab him and we'd roll. Um, he just had an excellent feel for things. Sometimes he just wouldn't realize when he's out of position, but um, the way he moved, it, he was definitely an athlete. And then he actually ended up teaching himself moves from Colette, uh, from Colette.com. It's a good way to learn. <laughs> That's a good way to learn if you're already athletic too, because Colette will, uh, will demonstrate something. He'll explain the, the small intricacies of one part of it. And then he'll just explode into something ridiculous and not explain that part. It's like I can't do that. <laughs> so many of the the uh, the things he shows like involve what you would call basic motions. Is a go, and then you're in the seat belt off the single leg, and then you back arch. I'm like, whoa, hold on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> How do you do that? This kid would but, come in, come into practice, and you'd say, "Coach, look at this thing I saw uh, on Colat." Then you would show it to me, and then a couple days later, you'd hit it in a match. Hmm. Yeah, I think that just confirms what most people already suspected, just that athleticism is the most important thing for transitioning to any combat sport. Like, if you're an athlete, you're gonna, it's going to work out as long as you have the proper guidance, um, which is interesting because I think in MMA, just the training, the way that it works, is so many people are working towards becoming athletes. Um, it's such an important part of MMA. I mean, I think all wrestlers are athletes as well, but some wrestlers can get away with like being very limited athletes, if you would agree, uh, like only being athletic in one regard, like maybe they're just strong or maybe they're just fast, or maybe they're just flexible, stuff like that. Whereas in MMA, like it's really hard to get away with not being at least decently well-rounded. Although at the higher levels in wrestling, I think the athleticism curve is a lot higher than it is in MMA just because the way the sport shapes you. Um, yeah, it's, it's something you notice. Uh, so yeah, just it's making me think, because uh, you you think about MMA fighters who did not wrestle, ha- don't have a wrestling background, who out wrestle wrestlers. A very interesting example I was looking at recently is a uh, Zach Makovsky and a uh, Juicy A Formiga. And Formiga, you know, comes from a jujitsu background, so in a way he wrestled, but you know, jujitsu players typically aren't known known for the takedown games. And I think uh, Formiga it was a gi player as well. So it's not like he really like had the wrestling background, but yeah, his, uh, he was taking, uh, he was taking Mikowski down with like body locks and like a lot of like very physical types of moves, like with not, without being like any sort of wrestler. And if you've seen Mikowski, he's like ridiculously athletic, ridiculously strong Pennsylvania wrestler, D one Drexel, all that stuff. Still getting taken down. And I think the classic example that commentators like to use is uh, George St. Pierre and Josh Koscheck. Koscheck, another Pennsylvania. Yeah, that was- <laughs> mm-hmm. Four time All American national champion. Going pretty even with uh, GSP in their first fight. I think they both got takedowns on each other. Second fight, can't touch him. Can't touch him. And like GSP, I think, is just everyone's example of a guy who didn't wrestle out wrestling everybody. And I, I guess what I'm leading into is you watch MMA a decent amount, you're, you're a fan. Uh, it's, I think it goes without saying that you don't need to know as many things from wrestling to wrestle an MMA as you do to wrestle a wrestling match because, I mean, first of all, you're forced, there's forced positioning in folk style. Uh, you need to be able to do top-bottom. Like, if you're training jiu-jitsu and you come to MMA, 
you don't necessarily need to work any of those folk style positions. I think a lot of them are helpful, as we see, because it's kind of working its way into the the grappling meta. Uh, but it, yeah, it's not it's not essential to know every single position in wrestling, and a lot of things just aren't going to translate. Not every pinning combination, not every turn, can be used as a submission or would be useful. Like a lot of stuff is working to put someone on their back. Most of the time in MMA, if you have the takedown, they're already on their back. So you don't have to worry about that as much. <laughs> so that, mm-hmm. that takes away a lot of a lot of uh, the, the stuff that a wrestler would work from top. Yeah. So you don't need to know as much, right? And plus, I mean, your takedowns are a little limited as well just because the entries are so limited. Like, you can't shoot things that come exclusively off certain ties or come off certain setups. Like, you're probably not arm dragging people. Like, you're probably not doing all these different things that are involved being in a tie up where you're just grappling for long periods of time. So I think there's less to learn. Um, so based on what you've seen and based on your coaching, what, what moves specifically, what techniques would you focus on with this new, with this new wrestler to, to prepare them for MMA defending and uh, attacking? Um, um, offensively, um, as far as leg attacks, probably just, uh, it's probably going to be pretty fundamental stuff, you know, Singles, doubles, um, from, from distance, or, um, or even not necessarily from distance, just singles, doubles, keep it simple. Um, something like a snap down go behind, which is pretty high scoring in wrestling, wouldn't really translate to MMA, I think, right. because of the dance. Um, trying to think what else. Um, hand fighting, not necessarily something like, like snapping or clubbing the head, but something like just pummeling for your underhooks. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I think, I think somebody who can get comfortable with upper body takedowns could see a lot of success. Right. Because again, you're wrestling from that upright stance and it, and there's a lot of re- uh, less risk of catching a, of catching a knee like Askren did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Sometimes Askren, in a lot of his fights, did just try to get upper body ties. Now, he did hit that, like, sag Polish throw on Damian Maya. So he's got it, he's got it in him still. It's just, yeah, he, uh, too desperate, too desperate to tie up. So, yeah, he's shooting from space a lot of the time. But yeah, go on. Sorry, I just wanted to talk about Ben Askren. <laughs> um, defensively, um, again, probably just, um again probably just keeping it simple um actually i was um in the marlboro coaches group chat one of our coaches sent us a youtube video of georgie um ivanov going over five lines of defense mm-hmm. um in wrestling your head's a line of uh defense that's one we might want to take out <laughs> and I, 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 I don't know anyone who would want to block punches with their head. But um, definitely using your hands, um, meeting a shot with your hips, kind of just taking away that momentum of them coming in, uh, sprawling, getting your legs back. One thing I I see I notice a lot is, particularly with fighters who didn't grow up wrestling, is they're not really trying to break the position on a shot like. Johnny Walker's one who jumps out at me right away because because he just fought recently. Uh-huh. Um, you know, he wasn't trying to stuff the head. I mean, it's hard to finish a takedown if your head's down. He he wasn't stuffing the head. He wasn't he wasn't um, trying to uh, he wasn't trying to uh, fight the hands off his off his legs. He. Um, with all due respect to to Johnny, he was kind of just spazzing and hopping across the cage. <laughs> no, I think that's accurate. That's pretty close to the truth. Yeah, it just seems like uh, the layers, the layers of defense seem to be what's missing for a lot of fighters. Like, uh, and, and a lot of it's complicated because they end up on the cage so often. 
and something you're going to be practicing in a wrestling room, for example, it probably isn't going to translate just because you're not working with the wall that often. Although in my high school wrestling room, I don't know about you, we were allowed to use the wall for you. Um, I don't ever remember a, a coach I've, I had saying like, yes, wall or no wall. But mm-hmm. my rule was always if the wall is padded and the mats against the wall, then the wall's in bounds. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think naturally some wrestlers might already kind of have that feel for what to do on the wall? Uh, like maybe they haven't drilled it, but they just like, oh, I've been here before. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I think it does build a certain comfort level, mm-hmm. uh, especially if you've watched MMA and, and seen some wrestling against the cage. Um, actually, um, in one of Aspen's technique videos, he describes the wall as being like a third leg you can use for balance. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, this past fall, I um, over at Rhino, which it's under different management now, but I'm, I still have ties to it because um, I'm, I'm friends with the new owners. A couple of them were my former teammates. And one of them was is a retired fighter who's good friends with Kurt Pellegrino. So one day oh, nice. he came in with um with one of his amateur fighters. Um and he was going over um a lot of wrestling against the wall. And while I'd never actually drilled takedowns against the wall, it mm-hmm. sort of intuitively made sense. He was he just um was having us in on a double and we were kind of just run our feet out to one side and have that hip up against the wall makes it a lot easier to drive across. Mm-hmm. Now once, once they're on the butt, their butt and against the wall, it's kind of hard to, to work your way out of that. Mm-hmm. I see a lot of wrestlers in MMA trying to finish uh, shots in the cage straight. And they're just so focused on like getting the legs together or whatever. It's trying to muscle their way through it instead of using footwork or trying to move the other person around. Like you, you have all the time in the world to set up a move to a new position. I was watching Jared Brooks today. I just did a video on Jared Brooks, and um, he was on a double on the cage against Davis and Figueredo. And uh, I was saying, like, oh, I think because uh, Figueredo had that wide side on stance that you get during, against the cage, which is not a situation you end up in in normal wrestling matches where you're trying to take someone down and they're like doing a split and their legs are all the way apart and you can't get their legs together because normally you could just go straight through them. Uh, but in this case, you know, he can't get his his arms together. And I was like, oh, it'd be really good if he could uh, pivot off to his left with that and, and move Figueredo off the cage for a second, then reshoot with him square with his legs narrow. And right as I was saying it, he did it. Um, but yeah, it seems like a, like a really conceptual thing that should translate because, I mean, on a double, you turn the corner. I mean, you're supposed to be turning them and, and narrowing that stance and getting a shot when their their base is narrow. Uh yeah, it's so interesting that, like, I think the ideas on the cage are the same. You just have to have it, like, talked out and feel it and everything like that. But some wrestlers, it seems like in MMA, they don't train it. Like, if you watch Johnny Hendricks and Rick Story, he got out-wrestled on the cage. Rick Story was on his legs the entire time, pushing him against the cage. Uh, Yoel Romero against Derek Brunson was getting taken down against the cage. And Brunson's a good wrestler. And, and so is Rick's story, but just comparatively, Hendricks and Romero were top top tier in terms of credentials. And then, uh, I don't, I don't think they're not, not, it's never yeah, they're not taking anything. those guys down. Uh, and then I think, uh, again, with Yoel Romero, Jacare, Jacare gave him a lot of issues on the cage. And Jacare is not a good shot wrestler, and he's wrestling one of the freestyle greats, and he's like nothing. Uh, see, so yeah, it's interesting. All right, I want to keep, I want to keep it relatively short, but I have one question for you. I'm going to put you on the spot here. Uh, so you're an MMA fighter now in this hypothetical, okay? Uh-huh. You're just starting out. You know your wrestling style. You know what you're good at. Can you tell me like what the very basic go-to parts of your wrestling game are and how you think you might be able to incorporate those in an MMA fight. Like, What would you do to get to those positions in MMA? Um, I need to think about this. So Start with like what you're good I, at in wrestling. <laughs> um. I generally get my best offense off either an underhook on my right side or a two-on-one on on my left side. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know how effective a two-on-one would be in 
in MMA because it's hard to get to. <laughs> hard to get to, and both your hands are occupied. He still has a free arm. Mm-hmm. Um, how would I get to the underhook? Um, I've got ideas. If you need any ideas, <laughs> uh, um, probably the simplest thing to do would probably be jab with my left hand and then try and dig that underhook with my right arm. Mm-hmm. So right there, we got a great idea because that's you're already thinking about this more than a lot of fighters do. I mean, and you're thinking about strike selection, right? So you're jabbing in to close the range, which is already step one of, of a process. And then what you're throwing with your rear hand to get to the underhook, it's something that's going to turn into an underhook, right? So I mean, like an uppercut, a hook to the body, you know, something else wide, like a level changing hook, something like that where you're sh- shooting, you're digging the underhook on the punch. But it's also a punch and even better is kind of what i'm alluding to from that you say okay this is how i get to my best position and from there i assume you're shooting off of it because you have it um but i mean you know that that's how you get to your position that's how you set it up to layer that deeper and to make that a higher percentage move for you you're also doing that setup without digging the underhook you're also just throwing the punch you're hitting the body you're hitting the head on that you're, you're just doing whatever your your punch is but then sometimes you're mixing it up and you're actually digging the underhook. One other thing that I did notice. Uh, well, actually, let me let me follow a question before I throw this out there. Once you have your underhook, so it's your righty underhook, uh, <clears throat> and I assume your 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 right leg lead at, right leg lead at this point after you dig it, you're stepping yeah, forward on yeah. that. Normally, wrestling from the left foot lead, but once off the underhook, it becomes a right foot lead. Yeah, which makes sense. You could jab your way and get it and then just step and you're free to change stances once you're in that tie-up. Um, how do you want your opponent to be standing to hit your shot? Um, I, once I have the underhook, I would probably pressure in and then try and read how he's reacting off of that. Mm-hmm. That's what I do from there. Like, um, my favorite takedown off the underhook in wrestling is a snap down. Again, as we touched on, I don't know how well that would translate to MMA. I think once you're in the tie up, it's available. Actually, you just have to think of a way to get them kind of lower in their stance to maybe, reach their head. Maybe <laughs> leg attack, getting them to pull that leg back. So now they're mm-hmm. a little more over. That makes sense. I'm telling you, you're thinking about this a lot more than <laughs> what I see from a lot of MMA fighters. So I don't know. That's just a little thought exercise. But I like it. I think you should do MMA now. I think this could work. Um, <laughs> especially you're uh, like a light heavyweight, middleweight type of range. Um, while I did wrestle 97 in college, I was not a true 197 pounder, actually. You're small. Yeah, I, I'm actually lighter right now than I was in college. I only weigh about 175, 180-ish right now. I think you should bulk up because I think your chances of success go up as you as you get heavier in weight. So let's bulk I, you up. Let's get this going. I, I like the I like the jab, dig in the underhook game. I think this could really work for us. <laughs> We're gonna make it happen. And you're in, you're in a you're in a hotbed for training too. You got plenty of options. Lots of gyms out there. Think about it. <laughs> I want you to ponder right. that. Now all we have to do is sell it to my Jewish mom. Yeah, no, it's maybe don't tell her. I don't know. <laughs> tell her cool. I'm doing cardio kickboxing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're you're helping out. You're you're helping out friends who are training. You're just going there to wrestle. That's it. You know, advising them on their career is no big deal. But you know, secretly you'll be developing this this system for your your snap down. We're gonna think about this. We're gonna think about snap downs. I'm gonna consult consult my my analysts. Uh, friends and we're going to talk about how to get this game going because I think it's I think it's there but yeah this is to to tie it all back together that is the point of this this podcast this is the point of the stuff I write about and I'm not I'm not on this end of things yet where I'm seeing what the wrestling is and thinking of okay how can how can MMA make that style work for you I'm seeing guys who are MMA fighters already who are wrestling and I'm trying to figure out what they're doing and if what they're doing serves the wrestling but that's a good example of how you can create a striking game that'll work for wrestling 
especially this this example still works as a striking game. It's not just yeah you know, for wrestling. And this is one thing. This is one sequence. I mean, you have other stuff too. We could, we could really build a whole game around uh, your best wrestling stuff. But yeah, I don't know. But anyway, this is great. Um, this does not have to be your only appearance by any means. Uh, I just got to think of other stuff to talk about. And uh, <laughs> I'd love to come back. This is fun. Yeah, yeah. And this is your podcasting debut? It is. This is my first time ever appearing on a podcast. Nice, nice. It's not all it's cracked up to be, but like you get like, a few dozen people minimum that they'll look at it and you're like, all right, I may, I got, I got some exposure and I got to air my, air my ideas. Uh, but yeah, I'm not going to be like Joe Rogan and tell you to start your own podcast, but it's really easy. Um, I'd retweet it if you, if you did it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's it for now. Uh, I'm going to end, end this one. There is no like next week I'm going to do, cause there's no set timeline for when these are coming out. At the time of recording this, I haven't even posted the first episode on like YouTube or anything, or like didn't done an article post for it. It is on Spotify just because I wanted to get it out. Um, but yeah, I haven't really officially launched yet, so I guess I got to put that one out first. I'm waiting on some more work because uh, our guy Yadsenan uh, with the site he does nice little cover photos. So I'm waiting on some more work, and then I'll do that one, and then I'll need a I'll need a picture from you to incorporate into the the cover photo for this episode and then uh yeah then I'll, I'll move on from there but whenever there is a next episode it's going to be a uh, a patreon request from uh dom dom garcy sorry if i'm saying your name wrong dom uh i also said your twitter handle wrong on another video so just you know don't hate me uh but yeah it's going to be about mike brown like thomas brown a uh, former wc featherweight champion and coach at american top team uh just about his wrestling style uh I think he wrestled at some like NAIA or like something, something at, at that level where it was like military. I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on it. It was in New England though. Uh, yeah, his wrestling style in MMA was cool. And he was a guy that loved underhooks. Uh, and he was a big body puncher and how his body punching worked in the underhooks. So I'm going to talk about Mike Brown uh, and it's going to be fun. Do you have any closing remarks? Do you have shout outs? You, you had stuff you're, you wanted to plug? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, my first I, blog is coming out on Saturday. It's called Stats Motion Level Change. Um, where I'm, I try to look at wrestling through a more quantitative lens. So, um, we see a lot of that in sports like baseball and basketball with the analytics and the sabermetrics. And, I, and I'm hoping to find a way to make that work within the context of wrestling. So um, my first blog post is going to be out on Saturday. I'm going to be taking a look at I'm going to try to quantify exactly how how much of a difference the crowd at Carver Hawkeye Arena makes for Iowa wrestling. Oh. <laughs> That's nice. That's cool. This it, that'll probably come out before I put this out, but I will put the the link in the description on Spotify and YouTube and make sure that people can get to that after this. And you'll that'll be on your Twitter account as uh, well. Yeah, I'm going to be tweeting out the link. And what's your what's your handle? It's a good one. At Goldier Boy Tell him. Spelled like Soldier Boy, but gold. <laughs> Perfect. I'm I'm at Edward Gal MMA, but you probably you probably know that if you're one of the like the five people that listen to this. But yeah, we're gonna we're gonna try to get some eyes on this because I wanna I wanna do right by Zach. But yeah, thanks for coming on. I'm gonna stop this recording now because I like to keep things under an hour. But yeah, good stuff.